Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 to 13. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For ye shall go out with joy, and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Amen. This chapter, Isaiah chapter 55, continues with another call to seek the Lord. But now it is more pointed and more urgent. Yes, the offer of salvation is free. It is extended graciously to all, but it is not a casual offer. It's not something to be taken lightly. It's not an offer to be taken for granted. It is not something that entails no obligations whatsoever for us. But there is, if you like, an instruction that comes along with this invitation, a gospel instruction along with the gospel invitation. And this instruction is that we as sinners must repent. Repentance is part of the gospel, part of accepting the gospel offer, part of accepting this invitation is to repent of our sinful ways. There is a requirement of repentance that is part of the gospel. We see that in verses 6 and 7 of Isaiah 55. Then after that, we see that there is a reason for this repentance. It is not an unreasonable thing for God to require us to repent. When we rightly understand sin and what it is as a defection from God's way, that reason we see in verses 8 and 9 of Isaiah chapter 55. And then finally, from verses 10 to 13, we see that there is a reward. There is a blessed consequence of repentance and faith, a reward for the full and complete acceptance of all that is included in the gospel offer, the gospel invitation. And we'll look at each of these in turn. First of all, we have to look at the requirement, the requirement of repentance. Verse 6 of Isaiah 55. Seek ye the Lord. And this means to come to God, seek God, come to Him desiring reconciliation and relationship with Him. Call upon Him, that's parallel, equivalent, to call upon God in worship, to pursue restoration of that relationship, to pursue communion with God. But this is not something to take lightly. Seek ye the Lord while He may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. We cannot expect to find God as and when we please. This is what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. There is an urgency to the gospel offer. It's not a casual offer, not something that we can put off and come back to at our leisure. It's not like catching a train. The train comes by every few minutes or every hour, perhaps, 
And if you happen to miss the train this time, never mind, just wait a few minutes, wait an hour or so, and there'll be another one. You'll have another opportunity, another chance. It's not a big deal. It's not something that you have to take very seriously. There's no great urgency. There's no great urgency to catching this train. The gospel offer is not like that. If anything, it's more like a flight, more like catching a flight. We are much more serious about catching a flight, much more desirous that we should not miss that flight, because we know it will be some time before we will get another chance, because we know that there is a penalty to missing that flight. There is an urgency involved. We don't want to miss the plane. But that's just a plane. It's just physically transporting us from one place on the earth to another. The gospel offer is infinitely more serious than that. It has to do not just with our earthly destination, but with our eternal destination, the eternal destiny of our souls and our bodies. It's not at all something to be taken lightly. There is that seriousness and that urgency to the gospel offer. God has indeed drawn near to us. God has made salvation available to us, but it is by His grace. It is a gracious offer. It's not a right that we can claim. Anytime we feel like it, we demand salvation from God. It's not a right to be saved, to be found in the Lord Jesus on the day of judgment. It's a gracious offer. And if we take it lightly, if we think we can just casually put it off, we may find that it is too late. We may find that the offer is closed. We may find that we have already departed this world. And then we look back when we stand before God's throne. But it is too late. The offer was there, but we never took it seriously. So there is this sense of urgency here. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. He has made himself near to you. Don't despise that. Don't disregard it. Don't take it lightly. God's nearness is a precious gift. It is a wonderful grace that he has displayed to us. We have to realize the seriousness of our condition. We are sinners against the law of a just and holy God, our Creator. We are rebels against His rule and authority. We have departed from His way. We are now walking in the path of sin and unrighteousness. Every moment that we put off our salvation, we are compounding our sin. We are adding to our rebellion against God. That's the condition that we are in. The gospel offer comes to us when we are at the lowest depths of rebellion. We are not in such a condition that we can afford to put off this offer or to take it lightly. Every moment that we decline, every moment that we reject, we are continuing in sin. We are furthering our rebellion against God. No, the gospel offer is something that should be accepted quickly. Of course, it should be accepted. It must be accepted genuinely and earnestly. But that comes as we recognize the seriousness of our condition and the seriousness of this offer. And so we see in verse 7 of Isaiah 55 that this seeking of God is not just idle curiosity on our part. Oh, I wonder what God is like. Let me see if I can find Him. No, this seeking after God comes from a recognition of sin and what it is. There must be that genuine recognition of our guilt before God and of our desperate need. Remember, back in verse 1 already, we saw that the gospel invitation is for those who are thirsty, for those who see their need. The gospel is not a casual offer to those who have everything already, but may, if they like, choose to have this thing in addition. The gospel offer doesn't come as some kind of glossy magazine catalog of furniture that you can use to beautify your home. You already have everything you need, but if you want a trinket to brighten up this corner or that corner, the gospel offer is not like that. The gospel offer doesn't come to us when we are rich in our own righteousness. It comes to us when we are utterly impoverished and destitute. The gospel offer comes to us when we are in desperate need. 
And without recognizing that need, without recognizing that salvation is not an option, but something that we desperately need, without that recognition of sin and what it is in our own lives, we cannot truly accept the gospel invitation. If we do not recognize sin, and if we do not repent of it. That's why in verse 7 it is said, let the wicked forsake his way. Taking up the gospel invitation requires this, repentance. And repentance is described here as a forsaking of our evil and wicked ways. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Even in our thoughts, we sin against God. God's law is not just something that governs our actions or even our words, it governs our thoughts. God made our hearts, God made our minds. His law governs what we are to think. Even in our thoughts, we can sin against God, and we do daily, constantly. But all these must be forsaken, all these sinful and wicked habits and patterns of thought, of word, of deed. All these must be put away. We must forsake them. That's part of accepting the gospel invitation. It's not that we must make ourselves holy first and then seek after God. We can never make ourselves holy. We need God to cleanse us and purify us and sanctify us. But we must turn away from these sinful and wicked ways. We must no longer desire them. We must no longer embrace or even tolerate sin in our lives. That change of attitude is a necessary component of the gospel. It's a necessary part of accepting the gospel invitation because we seek God to change us. And we seek that change because we recognize our own depravity and our own corruption. We don't delight in sin anymore, but we mourn for it. We don't hunger and thirst after the pleasures of sin. Now we hunger and thirst after righteousness. And it is with that changed attitude that we now seek after God, that we now come to Him to accept the gospel invitation. Repentance is required. And repentance is described here, not just as an outward show, but a genuine inner change of heart and attitude. And to those who come with this repentance, seeking God and salvation in Him, in the Gospel, to them this wonderful promise is given. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. That's the blessed and wonderful promise. Those who turn to Him in repentance, He will abundantly pardon. Abundantly. As the Apostle Paul puts it, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. In the words of that hymn, grace that is greater than all our sin. Yes, we have done terrible things, heinous things. As we look back at our lives, we we recoil at the corruption that we see there. We know our guilt. But we know God's grace is greater than that. God is able to pardon. However wicked, however sinful, whatever it is we have done, whatever combination of things we have done, however heinous and however numerous they are, God is able to pardon. He will abundantly pardon. That's the gospel offer. It is a blessed and wonderful offer to those who recognize how terrible sin is. To those who see that, this promise of abundant pardon is blessed beyond words. Think of the prodigal son, that parable that the Lord Jesus told, how this wicked son demanded the inheritance from his father and left his father's home and went into a far country seeking pleasure for himself, and how he wasted his life with riotous living. And at the end, he was left with nothing. 
looking back on the ruin that he had made of his life, he resolved to go back to his father's house. So ashamed and guilty was he, that he knew he did not deserve to be his father's son anymore. But he resolved to ask if he could but be admitted as one of his father's servants. But you remember what happened as the son was returning while he was yet a long way away. The father saw him and ran out to meet him and embraced him and welcomed him as his son and threw a feast to celebrate his return. That's a picture of the love and the abundant mercy of God. Whatever it is we have done, however we have hated and despised and blasphemed Him, whatever we have said against Him or done against Him or thought against Him, He is ready to pardon. He will abundantly pardon. God is working in your heart today. Don't delay. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. If God is working, He is ready to pardon. You need not delay. You must not delay. If you can see the seriousness of your sin, and if you can grasp the grace and the mercy of God extended to you in the Gospel, seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Plead for your salvation. Plead with repentance he will abundantly pardon. You may have tried what this prodigal son tried. Like him, you may have wasted your life searching after pleasure and satisfaction from the world and found nothing but waste and ruin and loss. But realize that if you return to God, he will receive you. If you return repentant, he will pardon all your sins, and He will welcome you back as His child. You need no more be forsaken of God if you will forsake your wicked ways and your wicked thoughts and return to Him. You will find mercy and pardon and security. See what it says here, return to our God. That's what God is like. The word our emphasizes the covenantal, relational nature of God. He desires relationship with us. He wants to be our God. He made us to have this fellowship and communion with Him. We defected from that relationship. We left Him. We departed from Him. He is waiting and ready in the Gospel, in the Lord Jesus, to receive us again if we will only repent of our sins and return to Him. That's the requirement of repentance, part of the gospel invitation. But as we read on, we find that this requirement of repentance is not not at all unreasonable. It's not a loss to us to forsake our ways and accept God's ways, but it is gain. When we leave our wicked ways, we are not leaving something that is good for us. We are leaving something that is bad for us. And when we adopt and conform ourselves now to God's ways, we are doing what is good for us. God's ways are higher and better than our ways. God's thoughts are higher and better than our thoughts. They are not our ways. Verse 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. There is a difference. But what kind of difference is this? Verse 9, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. When we forsake our ways and submit to God's rule, we are not, as it were, downgrading our lives, but upgrading. We are exchanging earth for heaven. We give up this world, but we gain something far better. We gain a heavenly kingdom for eternity. God's ways are infinitely higher than our ways. God's way of salvation is infinitely higher than our way. We try to save ourselves. We try to achieve righteousness on our own. We bear the burden of trying to keep the law 
on our own strength and we can't do it. It's a lousy way. It's impossible for us. But God's way is so much better. God's way rests in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now our salvation, when we come to Him on His terms, does not depend on anything that we do, anything that we have accomplished. It rests on the finished work of Christ, and so it is eternally secure. The work of Christ, the redemptive, salvific work of Christ is done, it's finished, it's completed. Nothing can ever take away from it. Our salvation, because it rests in Him, can never be lost. That's an infinitely higher and better way of salvation. It's not something any man could have come up with, but it's what God reveals was His eternal plan and purpose. and He has done it. Not only is God's way of salvation higher than our way, God's way of life, of holy living, is also infinitely higher and better than our way. Again, we try to live our own way. We try to define right and wrong. We try to decide morality for ourselves without God, without recourse to His law or His word. And we find ourselves in a confused and tangled mess when we try to live according to our own hearts and our own desires and our own opinions and philosophies. We are not capable of devising a better law than God's law. His way is the best way to live. His law is the best rule for our lives. His ways are infinitely higher and better than our ways. We ought to abandon our attempts to save ourselves. We ought to abandon our efforts to live according to our own rules. We must embrace God's way of salvation and God's way of life. Then we give up earth we gain heaven. We upgrade from what is infinitely poorer to what is infinitely richer and better. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And because God's ways are so far higher than our ways, we are really not in a position to judge them and to evaluate them for ourselves as if we can see whether God's law is worthy of our assent or not, as if by our own depraved and corrupted, sinful understanding, we can judge God's law and see whether it is really moral or not. That is blasphemous pride. God is our creator. His law is perfect. Now, that's not to say that God's law is at all unreasonable or immoral. In fact, as we study it, we find that it is indeed most wise, most reasonable, most wonderfully just. And God's law is part of His people's witness to His justice and holiness and wisdom. All the way back in Deuteronomy chapter 4, this is what God through Moses said to the nation of Israel or the people of Israel at that time. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me. This is Moses speaking. That ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great, that hath statutes and judgments, so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day? God's law was part of his people's witness. It was meant to point the world to the perfection of God himself. But we must begin accepting God's law with this understanding that it is His law. Any right apprehension of God's law must begin with the recognition that this law is infinitely higher than us. It is God's law. It is something to which we must submit. It is a rule to which we must yield our lives. 
And so what we see around us in this world, increasingly an abandoning of God's law, an abandoning of right and wrong as scripture defines them. This is not a good sign. This is not a good movement. This is not progress. Emancipation, if it can be called that, from God's law is not a virtue. It is not a sign of maturity to be loosed from the shackles of this law, for they are no shackles at all. In fact, by casting off this law, we bind ourselves to our own sin and our own depravity. No, turning away from God's law and calling it outdated, calling it old-fashioned, calling it immoral, as the people of the world do today, is not maturity but foolishness, and it will lead to our peril. You and I have to recognize that God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. There is salvation available to us freely, but we must forsake our wickedness and forsake our sin. We must not argue with God about what sin is, but accept what His Word says and repent when we are convicted. Repent when God's Word reveals our sin, recognizing that His law is infinitely higher. And then as we go on, verse 10 and onwards of Isaiah 55, we do indeed see that far from, from being restrictive and limiting, God's way, God's word, God's law, when it is obeyed, in fact leads to our flourishing and our prosperity. And so verse 10 picks up this use of heaven and earth in the previous verse and now gives us this image of the rain. The rain as something that God sends from heaven down to earth. You see that here, as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. You have this picture here of rain coming down from heaven to earth and it does not just hit the earth and then vanish. It has an effect. It accomplishes something. And what does it accomplish when it reaches the earth? It accomplishes life and growth for the world. The plants grow and bring forth and bud and fruit and bear because of the rain that waters the earth. There's that wonderful picture of life-giving nourishment and growth. And then God applies that to His Word, to His law, just as the rain that comes down from heaven brings life and growth and flourishing to the natural world. So also God's Word. God's law, the revelation of His ways, the revelation of His thoughts to us has an effect, a life-giving effect on those who receive it. It brings about flourishing, spiritual flourishing, just as the rain brings about nat natural flourishing. That's what God's Word is. That revelation of His ways and His thoughts, infinitely higher than us, inaccessible to us, except that God has revealed them to us. He has clothed them, as it were, in human language and placed them here so that that book that you hold in your hands, the Bible, is that word that is breathed out from the very mouth of God. That's how it's described in 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, breathed out from God. That word you hold in your hands is this same life-giving, nourishing word that the prophet Isaiah describes here. This same powerful word. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. It shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. God's word is powerful and effective just as the rain is effective, because God has designed it and ordained it to be effective, to have that effect. So God has ordained His Word that it should never return to Him void, empty. It will never return having accomplished nothing, but it will accomplish that which God has purposed for it. God's Word is powerful because it is His Word. 
It is the word of the sovereign and omnipotent God. It's not man's word. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 21. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. This is not man's book. Yes, it was written in human language. It was written using human authors. But these are God's words, not man's words. God so superintended and ordained that whole process that through these fallible instruments, humans, God was able to give us this perfect word. God used humans also to preserve it so that we have it in our hands today. This life-giving word breathed out from the mouth of God. This powerful word. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. God's word reveals who we are. It reveals our sinful nature. It speaks the truth to us concerning our depravity and the wickedness of our ways, and the truth concerning God's way of salvation. It reveals to us the need that we have to repent and forsake our ways and return to our God. And it pierces, it pierces us, it discerns us, it lays bare the secrets of our heart as we read God's word. He knows us, he made us. And in his word, we find the evidence of that intimate knowledge that he has of us as our creator. And he tells us plainly, this is who you are. This is what sin has made you. This is what you can be in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you will repent and return. And now in verses 12 and 13, we have this life-giving purpose even further described in such wonderful terms. Verse 12, For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. When God's word, when God's plan laid out in his word is accomplished, then those who have yielded themselves to him will find joy and perfect peace in this world. No more sorrow, no more fear, but peace, a full security in God and a full satisfaction in him. Again, verse 2, you have labored for that which does not satisfy. But if you will forsake your ways, forsake your feeble and misguided attempts to save yourself and return to God and trust in Christ for salvation, then you will have this assurance and then joy and peace will be yours in that kingdom to come for eternity. Even nature itself will be transformed. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Even nature itself will be transformed into a reflection of this joy and peace. You realize that the natural world now is a reflection of the fallen state of humanity. Right from the time when our first parents sinned, God said to Adam, Cursed be the ground for your sake. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth unto you. And from that day until now, as the Apostle Paul describes it, the whole creation groans and travails together until now. Because God's salvation has not yet been consummated. Now this is still a fallen world, full of thorns and thistles, full of death and decay and corruption, full of disasters and calamities, full of hurt and hatred and pain. But the time will come in God's perfect plan, and all of this will be over, when creation itself will be redeemed and restored and renewed, and God's people will have a place in that world to come. Perfect peace, where even nature itself is transformed with joy 
and peace. Verse 13, instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name. All of this will be to the glory of God, the everlasting glory of God, who has accomplished all this according to his word, and even by and through his powerful word. This is the promise of God to all who will hearken to his word. Will you heed this gracious offer? Will you heed this invitation by putting away your ways which are evil and returning to God and now accepting and yielding to his ways which are good and pure and perfect? Realize that there is one God, therefore there is only one way to live. Everything else is false and counterfeit. Everything else will not prosper. Again, remember Psalm 1. The Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. That's the way that you and I are in outside of Christ. We are in the way of the ungodly. We are heading towards destruction. There is only one right way to live, and it is God's way. We must yield to that. God's word cannot fail to accomplish his purpose. And if you will repent and believe in the Lord Jesus, then his good purpose will be accomplished in you. What we have read in verses 12 and 13 will be a description of your eternity. That is your eternal destiny that you read there, if you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. But know that God also has a just and a holy and a terrible purpose for those who refuse and reject his gracious offer of salvation. If we will have what God offers graciously and freely, then we have salvation for eternity. But if we reject what God offers graciously and freely, if we will not have it, then instead we will have what we deserve justly and eternally. Our eternal destiny will be exactly what we deserve for our own sins and our own transgressions against God's law. His word will accomplish either one of those two things. Either it will save us through the gospel or it will condemn us through the righteous and holy law of God. To borrow the words of Moses, which he spoke to the children of Israel, Deuteronomy 13, 30 verse 19, God's word sets before us, even before you and before me, this day. God's word sets before us life and death. Therefore, choose life. Forsake death. Choose life, that you may live eternally and be blessed forever in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, indeed the gospel is a wonderful and a gracious offer. It comes to us when we are at our lowest point. We see ourselves to be sinners, utterly depraved and condemned, unworthy. And yet you show us how much you love us and how you are willing and ready and gracious to pardon abundantly. How your grace is greater than all our sin. Lord, once more we pray for anyone who is listening, who has not repented, who has not believed in the Lord Jesus. Your word is powerful. Your word is able to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. Reveal to us through your word our sinfulness and our corruption and our need of salvation. Help us to see if we have been deceived or if we have deceived ourselves and failed to repent truly pray that by your powerful word and by your spirit, you will bring us to the Savior, bring us to a forsaking of our evil ways and an acceptance of your perfect ways. We ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for his sake. Amen.